it was quite incredible. It was in this 13 aside. There was so many players in this tight gym. And within 10 minutes of watching him, he'd scored about seven goals. And I remember Ozzy sometimes saying, Stevie, Stevie, why you keep shouting? Don't shout, don't shout. And he, and he went, well, you're a World Cup winner. He said, you might not need some, but players need to be, we need to talk. He's just got this calmness about him. You know, he's unflustered, really. He just knows what he's good at, knows left foot, right foot, headers, all round striker. Hello, I'm Jeff Stelling, and this is Football's Greatest. Each week, I'll be sitting down with a legend to discuss and debate some of the best exponents of the beautiful game. The players that got you off your seat, the hard men that made you wince, and the moments that will stay with you for life. Now, in this episode, I've been joined by an all-time Tottenham great who is going to pick his five favourite Spurs players of all time. Glenn Hoddle, thanks for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yeah, Great to be here, Jeff. Just before we get into the five you picked, I just want to tell people about those you haven't. Oh, I know. There's no Ledley King, oh. no Gascoigne, oh. no Ginola, no Bale, no Lineker, no Blancheflower, no Modric, <laughs> no Klinsman, no Sheringham, no Mullery, no Waddle, oh, no dear. Son, no Pat Jennings. Do you want to have a rethink? Oh, I know. Uh, I, you know what? When I was asked to do it, I'm thinking... I can't leave him out. And then I put, I, I did it. And then I thought, well, I can't leave him out. So I've got to put him in. And there's just a list. That, I mean, that was one thing. Spurs may not have won as many trophies as we would love to have done over the years. But my word, there's been individuals, oh. you know, that's a club that knows how to produce or buy, however, uh, special players, what I call players, special players. And the list you've just, I don't think you mentioned Dave Mackay even then. No. In that, you know? I, listen, it, it was so hard to do, and you know, some I've played with, and some I watched as a kid when, and I was an apprentice at Tottenham. But it was an impossible question, and I've had an impossible <laughs> answer because you're right. I kept thinking about the ones I've left out. Your Sheringhams and your well, it, it, it's Gaza, and the only reason I left Gaza out was the length of time that he was at Tottenham, and probably Chrissy as well. Mm. Wads was a fabulous player. Love playing with him. Oh, it was so hard. Anyway, let's get to well, the, let's let's get to the, the five, five that I've picked. Let's talk the five that you've put in. <laughs> Who's the first of them then? Well, I'm not going to put them in any sort yeah. of order. I can't remember them now. Uh, what I put down, actually. But let's go with, the, with I think, the greatest goal scorer I think the country's ever, Jimmy Greaves. You know, as a kid, watching him play and watching him. when I, I saw him come back for his testimonial, you know. They gave him a testimonial and he'd finished playing, I think, at West Ham. And he'd been out about... I can't remember how many a year. So he came back to train and I was an apprentice and I was watching him in the gym for upstairs in the gallery. And um, it was quite incredible. It was in this 13 aside. It was so many players in this tight gym. And within 10 minutes of watching him, he'd scored about seven goals. And he was forever looking over his shoulder. He was never looking at the ball. And he was looking over, always looking over his shoulder where the goal was, where his opponents were. And my word, within two touches, bang, it was in the back of the net. And it was like, wow. And then watching him play and the thing, it, it just f unbelievable goal scorer. An unbelievable glider of, on the pitch, on terrible pitches. Even worse, perhaps, than when I played. They were even worse then, back then, when Jimmy was playing. And he glided and he, he went across the top of the surface so quick. Where a lot of players go through the surface, he was on he was on the top of it, and he looked like he was just a cut above anything else uh, in and around that penalty area. Did you take something from him then, with that you know awareness that he had, that vision? That I he did had? actually. Yeah, I remember thinking about him and looking over his shoulder. And as a midfield player, you're right in the hub of it. You're you know you're playing with 360 degrees, as I like to say, and you've got to have that vision. And you but you so you've got to be aware of everyone that's that you can't see on your blind side. So um, yeah, taking that and seeing that, you think, wow, I can use that. Mm -hmm. So that was a very what was I 15 when I, I was watching him then. And mm -hmm. So that was that was a real eye opener for me. But Jimmy was a was a class class player, class player, mm -hmm. and and what a well what a record of goal scorers. Yeah, incredible. Because you know, because he wasn't big and physical, no, no. It, 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 but he was always one step ahead, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, and he's, he's a, you know, he just had that instinct that all great goal scorers have got. Actually, that that instinct that you can't coach. It's just it score individual goals as well. Don't get me wrong. You know, some beautiful goals I remember him scoring from the halfway line. But he just knew where the where the ball was going to drop. He knew what you know where it was going to where mistakes were going to happen. Oh, I had that instinct, yeah. So Jimmy would be definitely in most people's top five, yeah. I think. Yeah. I, I know, you know, 
watching Barcelona when Messi was in his prime, mm. I used to almost not watch the game because I'd just be watching Messi, mm. who would be 30 yards from the ball, but his head would be on a swivel, yeah. just looking at where everybody was. So when Assessing it came, things, his yeah. awareness was, yeah. was was brilliant. Yeah, that's that's where you know that you're ahead of the game. It's like a it's like a game of chess. Mm. Now, thanks for watching Football's Greatest on YouTube. But can I ask you please to hit that subscribe button? That way you won't miss any of our future episodes and we have some great guests coming up on the show. OK, so um, one striker there. Uh, you've, you've included two more strikers in your, mm. your top five, yeah. Glenn. Yeah, I certainly have. You know what? Let's go with Martin. Martin Chivers was a fantastic centre forward. Um not because he saw me as a kid and he, he recommended me and backed up what the scouts had already said for me but to get to But that's a help, mind you, isn't it? Well, it's a big help at the time, yeah, I've got to say. The spinny dynamos. Spinny dynamos in a cup final, yeah. So not because of that reason, Martin, but Martin, you've got to look at the history of Tottenham and you've got to see when, when successful teams were built and whatever. And Chiv was, was, um, was, was, a, was a massive, massive part of that. You, I remember going with my dad to the League Cup final at Wembley, Aston Villa, and and Martin scoring the two goals. And that went won a trophy for a while and it was, you know, so that had an impact on me as a as a fan going there as a youngster. And and then the two goals he scored in the UEFA Cup final. Um massive for the history of the club. Yeah. You know? Two wonderful goals. But but Martin was just such a such a skillful player for such a big frame. He was a target man back in the day. You know, they'd go from back to front, and and him and Alan Gilzine, you know, were were, uh, were the two strikers that had this little telepathic sort of understanding, really. And but Martin, I remember playing with Martin. Although he must have, must have felt a bit old, really, because I, he, I made my full debut and he was in the game in the team. But I played with him in the reserves. I remember saying to my dad, I said, "Oh, it was wonderful because I'd make a run." The yeah, ball would be going into the striker and, and at certain centre uh, centre forwards, you think, well, I'll make the run, but I weren't sure whether it was coming. So when it doesn't come, you think, oh, shall I make that run again? Because I'm out of the game if I make that run. You make a run with Martin in the reserves. I was only 16. I'd make a run and whether it was off his head, off his chest, off his thigh, off his foot, the ball would just land at my foot. And then I'd be had the momentum to go and, you know, you get a little dummy for your, for your defender who's marking you in midfield, make a run, boom, and it was there. It was like delivery you know deliveroo yeah. <laughs> it was beautiful and I said dad every time I made a run the ball was there it was just lovely to play in so having played with Martin at that level as a youngster and then play with him in the first team later on um, you know I was only 12 when he saw me at that in that final for Spinny Dynamos it must have been a strange feeling for him actually there's him picking out a little 12 year old and end up playing with him which was <laughs> fascinating it was fantastic but he was such a influence on the uh, on that on that team in the 70s and a lovely smashing guy yeah. but big goals big goals in big moments uh, Martin excellent I, I, I looked at his international record as well you know mm. Glenn because he got scored 13 in 24 internationals yeah. so better than one in two yeah. yet after England went out of the World Cup in, in the Poland game mm. In 1973, he never played for them again, even that, though he was only 28. Yeah, that was it Sounds strange. like he'd be made a scapegoat. Yeah, it looks that way, doesn't it? And and as you say, 28, you're in your prime. Yeah. Um, very under underrated player. I mean, a lot of people might say, well, you're top five, Glenn. You've left out so and so and so and so. But I'm going from somebody that knows the club inside out, from a fan to apprentice, playing with him. And, and so I'm going from those eyes. And the effect he had... On the club's history, really, of winning trophies in big games, Martin certainly didn't let you down. He was he was the top man, and for those sort of three four seasons, he was he was absolutely fantastic. I remember the long throw as well. He had this long throw. It was a shame he weren't in the middle as well to flick it on. But <laughs> he had this long throw. Chivers, chivers. I remember being behind the goal at the Park Lane, singing his name. So it was uh, it was brilliant. Well, you've got one more striker. Shall we go with him next before yeah. the midfield players? Well, it's it's the modern day. I mean, obviously he's moved on to Germany, but Harry Harry Kane has been sensational since he's come into the first team, really, at Tottenham. The uh, the goals that he scored, the way he's played and added to his dimension to his game before he's gone to Germany, probably doesn't need that as much, playing for Munich. But wonderful finisher, you know, and, and the, he's just got this calmness about him. You know, he's unflustered, really, just 
knows what he's good at, knows left foot, right foot, headers, all round striker that um, that as a modern day centre forward that's going out of the game. Actually, a lot of teams are not playing with that type of player, but he's so good that he would have he would have walked into Man City if they could have got him. He would go into any like Munich. Um, so a, a wonderful player that's come through the ranks, come through a different way, actually. You know, he was sent out on loan to, to Yeovil and places like Millwall and different places. Well, I've got his record here, yeah. you know. 5-18 for Leighton Orient, 9-27 for Millwall, mm. non in 5 for Norwich, 2-15 mm. for Leicester. And Tim Sherwood said when he was manager at Spurs that the club wanted to get rid of him. Well, that's that. see, that gives you heart, doesn't it? Any yeah. youngster out there that's... Not finding it easy, let's put it that way at the time. Then Harry Kane, look look at Harry Kane's situation. Great example, isn't he? Great example. You have to have the talent in the end. And suddenly something obviously clicked. Somebody's given him a chance. I think it was under Harry, I think. Harry Redknapp. I think Tim did. I think Tim, oh, Tim Sherwood was, was the first one. It was in Europa, wasn't it? There was a you know. game, I think there was a game yeah. that played and suddenly scored. And that confidence. Confidence is a massive thing, especially with a young player. And if you haven't got that confidence, then you need something to trigger it, whether it's a manager or whether it's a goal, simply thing as a goal at a top level in the first team. But you've got to have the talent, and he's proved that um, that you can go, you can make it in a different way, totally different way. And um, credit to him, credit to him. And you know, he's probably the first one to admit back then he'd have probably, if someone said to him, you know, by the year two thousand and twenty-three, you're going to be the best striker in the world, son. He'd look at him and go, are you, are you sure? Yeah. No way, you know, but that's football, that's life. And he deserves it because he's been absolutely brilliant. He, he, he has. And, a, he... And, and what a great ambassador for the game. Yeah. Not only for Tottenham and for England, but for himself and his family. Fantastic ambassador, great example for kids. There's nothing you can really say that's negative with Harry. Really. And, and, and as a great passer of the ball yourself... Do you enjoy those moments when he drops deeper and then sprays the ball around as if he could have been a yeah. midfield player, a la Glenn Hoddle? Well, he, well, he. I feel sorry for him to a certain degree because there's, there's, there was a his back end of his career before he went. Obviously, um, he had to play nine and ten. He had to play a nine row and a ten. Should have had a half cut number on his shirt because he was dropping in there and he was making some fantastic passes and, and whatever. But I think it was Spurs needed him to do that. At Munich, he doesn't need to do that. If he'd have gone to Man City, he wouldn't have needed to do that. But because it's horses for courses football, he's gone, you know what, I, I can offer a bit more if for the, the team need me to do that. But what he did do is he arrived in the box still. He didn't take away his goal scoring uh, press. So credit to him, he's added, he added, he's added to his game. And he can do that if he wants to do it. I don't think he'll need to do it. He might need to do it more, maybe a little bit with England. Maybe not. Maybe now England are in. We've got enough of offensive players that he might not need to do that so much. But he certainly did at Tottenham, and he and he, he did it because of what the team needed. Might have sacrificed a little bit, but I think he enjoys coming dro dropping in there and making them passes. And uh, credit to him, he's it, he's added to his to his his bow. He's added to himself as a player, which is fantastic. So, no, no surprise about how well he's done in Munich. No, my word, he's well. He's just hit the road running, and he's just like, well, he's had. It's like he's had five seasons there. Maybe he finds that league a little bit easier. You know, it is the toughest league, the Premier League, and he's done it here. So it's probably he hasn't. He's not playing against. You know, that league isn't as quite the same as it is when you're playing the bottom teams in the Premier League. You know, it's on every game. Perhaps with Bayern Munich, they're so powerful. There's five or six, seven, eight games where they're top games. The rest, I think he's, you know, and that's not Harry's fault, but he's, he's hit the road running there. He's, he's, he's done brilliant. You may have heard that NordVPN is an essential cybersecurity tool which protects all your personal data whilst online. But did you know, it could save you money. With NordVPN, you can take advantage of cheaper pricing in other countries by switching your location with one click. For example, if you're going on holiday, you can book flights, hotels and rental cars via another region and take advantage of the cheaper prices in that region. NordVPN is the same price as a cup of coffee a month, but with these savings, NordVPN essentially pays for itself. 
To grab our huge discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com slash fgpod. This code will also give you four extra months on the two-year plan. There's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. The link is in the episode description box. OK, a couple of midfielders then that you've chosen, Glenn. Yeah, I think um, Aussie. Aussie was so unique and had a massive influence with, with the team, with myself, somebody, as I said, that, that we gelled straight away once we got in each other's company and started playing football together, training together. And he was a unique player in many ways in the sense that he's, he covered the ground over five or six yards so quickly so quickly and used to run at people, big players trying to kick him and he'd old players off and quite unique actually in many ways. He wasn't a purveyor of the ball. He wouldn't hit sort of, every now and again he would, but he wasn't like one of these players that would hit a pass that would take a team out in one pass. He didn't hit many players, but he used to run at people and attack them and go by them and um, and, and lend you the ball. <laughs> I always say, you know, you'd lend, he'd lend you it because he wanted it back. And... Um, but wonderful player, a unique player, different player. And I'll tell you what Ozzy did as well. He taught me, he read the game. It was like a game, he was good at chess actually. He, he, he was like a chess game to Ozzy. He would be one or two moves, particularly when the opponents had the ball. He actually had this unique sort of, he could sniff out when someone was going to lose the ball and get in position. And then he'd go and nick the ball sometimes. And when he'd come from nowhere and... Um, and, and, and pinch the ball and we'd be off on the attack. And I'm thinking, well, we're just defending. Now we're on the attack. He was a, he was a very unique player, was he? And, and you know what, with Ricky as well coming, not only were they World Cup winners, they were fabulous players. They were, they were, they were very humble. Very humble guys, both of them, really good guys. They had a great sense of humour. To have to be in Aussie's company as a player, and now I still see him now. We play golf. He's a wonderful guy. He really is. Both of them so humble. They could have come over as big, big time Charlies. We've won the World Cup. Not, not a bit. It was, uh, and you know, forty odd years later, he's still living in this country. And um, still can't talk English, but you know that's another thing. <laughs> yeah, but, but that was that was one of the things, wasn't it? He's come from Argentina, yeah. Um, you, you know, a time when there wasn't a big foreign influx in into this country. He doesn't speak the language at all, mm -hmm. and yet here you are, a couple of years later. You know, Tottenham are making a song about him, Aussie's yeah. dream. <laughs> Aussie's you know? dream. Yeah. You, you, you couldn't write that. Aussie's could you? going to Wembley, yeah. yeah. And uh, that was a bit when I've never seen him so nervous when we had to do the bit when he has to say his individual bit in the cup for Tottenham. <laughs> 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 he was so nervous and he, he couldn't do it and we're giving him stick you imagine in the studio and yeah. uh, it's the only time I've really seen him have a panic up I think what people <laughs> also forget now is that at the time when Ozzy and Ricky Villa were in this country, that was the time when the UK went to war yeah. with with Argentina yeah. which was an incredibly difficult time for them wasn't it because I think yeah. that Ozzy people knew he loved life in, in Tottenham so mm. in, in this country in, in in certain places, he was regarded, you know, as the enemy. But back home in Argentina, mm. he was also the enemy. regarded as the the enemy because yeah. of his love for for this country. Absolutely, it was a tough time, tough time for him and Ricky. And um, and we did as much as we can as teammates to help him. And the club did, I know that. And Keith Birkinshaw. And but it was we knew it was inside. It was churning, you know. And I think in the end, he went. If I believe it, he went away for a loan period. Somewhere. Yeah, I think he went to PSG. He didn't went to he? PSG, didn't he? He came back. Yeah, and it was it was a tough time for him, but we knew that he had the personality and the character to deal with it. But it was still, it was different. It wasn't football related. It was this this was this was totally different. You yeah. know, no one can be be um, taught how to deal with those things. But Ozzy was experienced enough and and dealt with it all. And he always had that sense of humour. Ozzy is such a funny man. He's he has me in stitches still now, and um, and he had that. Both of them had that. But I said, the one thing he had it was not only his ability and his World Cup winner. He just had this humility about him, and he still has now. Tottenham fans absolutely loved him. Then I mean, they 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 produced a banner, didn't they, one day, which said, "Argentina can keep the Falklands, we'll keep Aussie." <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and that's that was what it was like. We were like um back then it was a bit more like a family. It really was. Um and and that's you protect your family, don't you? And that's what we tried as as well as we could do. But he, he come through it with flying colours like he 
and he's um, come through everything. Yeah. Like, well, apart from when I play golf with him, obviously. <laughs> you always beat him. <laughs> well, he's a bandit. Let's put it that way. He's off a bandit handicap. He, he, he won a trophy um, the other the other week, well, a few years, a variety club, was it? And um, in his team, they won. And his speech was, well, obviously, he said, you didn't cheat as well as we all cheated. <laughs> That was his speech <laughs> after he won the, the, brilliant, the golf. Brilliant. I like, uh, yeah, yeah, I honestly up. tell you, I've never, ever heard anyone have a bad word to say about Aussie Art no, dealers. No, he's a great man. Lovely man. Your other choice, your one remaining choice, I've never heard anybody have a bad word to say about him either. Is, uh, uh, I can't remember when I put my name in. Steve Perryman. Oh, cool. Skip. Skip. I call yeah. him a skip, see? Well, yeah, yeah. Stevie, oh, my word. I couldn't do a top five without Steve. No, because more 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 games than anyone at the club, you know. And yeah. and, and and the one thing I, I, when I was an apprentice, a schoolboy, an apprentice coming through. I mean, it was hard. It was a hard school that that first team. When I was an apprentice, I think about Joe Cunn here, and phew, there was some hard characters, some tough there. guys oh, there. Oh dear! Yeah. And Steve was the one that I looked at. He was an 18, 19 year old. He was the younger one. But the way he held himself, the way he he didn't give a stick, he helped us, you know, and and I thought, mm, yeah, you're a class act, this is good. And then eventually getting in the first team and then him being the skipper, he's the best skipper I've, I've, I've played under in the sense that he had everything because good skippers are not ones that are going to show and show the world everything. It was the little things that he would say. He could be fierce. If you thought you were out of order or you're wrong, he'd be fierce with you. But then he would encourage you the next moment. He was spot on. He was an extension of the manager on the pitch. Um, and he would talk to players and he'd spend time. And he spent time with me as a youngster. And I remember him saying to me, pulling me, I was 17, 18, just got in the first team. And, and he went, Glenn, he said, the coaches will try and do this. Try and, he said, make sure you listen. Give them respect to listen, he said. But take in what you want to take in that, that, that you think's right for you because you're a unique player. He said, but let the other stuff go. And I think he was talking from his own experience in many ways. And that was great advice for me. And uh, and then on the pitch, he was he was wonderful to play with because he, he was a talker. He could talk. He read the game. And um, and I remember Ozzy sometimes saying, Ozzy, why? Uh, sorry, Stevie, Stevie, why you keep shouting? Don't shout, don't shout. And he, and he went, well, you're a World Cup winner. He said, you might not need some, but players need to be, we need to talk. If you talk, if we talk, we make a 12th man. The language of football language, we make a 12th man on the pitch. If everyone talks and gives information and, and Ozzy and him will go, ah, oh, Ozzy go, no, <laughs> go for one. And, um, but Steve was a great talker. You know, he'd pass, he'd, he, he, I learned something with Steve, which I brought into coaching, put information on your pass. So Steve would pass a ball into you and he would only offer, because he'd be seeing that, he'd say, Tony, Tony Galvin's on. And he'd be on the other side of the pitch. But it was great information because he knew I could actually manipulate the ball and ping it out there and have the confidence to do it. And he had this, he, he would talk to all the players like that. And off the pitch, on the pitch, whatever, great captain and um, and a good player. Well, I watched him as an apprentice in the centre and midfield and he was he was one of those that you would you wouldn't want to play. He would get his foot in, he'd tackle, he was everywhere. And, and then he went back later on and played at the back, played at a sweeper and then he played right back most of the time in the 80s when we had it going there as a team and um terrific player great player i do hope you're enjoying the show i just want to tell you that you can follow us at at football's greatest pod on instagram tiktok and facebook and search for football's greatest pod to find us on x i was interested to see he only won one full england cap yeah, yeah. was he a bit unlucky he was yeah, I think he was unlucky at the time. There was a few... Because at that time, he, I think it was right back where he was. He might have, in a different era, he might have got in the midfield or even at the back, actually. But we weren't going to do that in England at that time, as I said to you. It was about big centre-backs. and So he wasn't going to get... But it, the right back, we had some good, we had some decent right backs. So I think it was a, it was a tough one. People didn't realise how good he was until you played with him or you saw him week in and week out, which sometimes doesn't happen with England managers. Obviously, you can't be everywhere. And the scouting wasn't quite the same. So, great player for me. Great use of the ball and um, tigerish, and but a great example 
for me as a young player coming in, you know, and I still, if I see him now, I still call him Skip. Mm. And that's the respect I've got for him, you know, and uh, all the players have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's ironic, isn't it, sitting here talking, Glenn, because I, I think Steve had um, a heart issue as well, didn't he? He and did. An aortic yeah. issue, and his life mm. had to be saved uh, as well. So you, you, you boys have got a few things in common, in common, to say the Absolutely. least. Absolutely, yeah. I don't know what it is about Tottenham. Aussies had a heart problem as well. And uh, there's quite a few at Tottenham. It might be the club. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> but people, still... all, people have always said Tottenham got no heart, you know? So, I mean, this is <laughs> well, clearly sure a case that, that they have. Yeah. Only Tottenham critics, of course. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. But no, Steve, Stevie was the skip and... Um, so influential in that eighties when we had a good side, and obviously he had he had he had success in the League Cup in the seventies and the UEFA Cup then. So you know he had one. He was the only one really in an era that had won trophies. Obviously, Ozzy and Rick had won, but that team we hadn't won anything till eighty one. So it was it was having that influence, having that experience around us that was was extra special. Mm. Is it just a final point on captaincy? Because you're saying what a great leader he was. Mm. Is, is it different captaining? You know, being captain at your club. You know, we, you're surrounded by the same players week in and week out. Mm. Than it is at international level. Totally different. Yeah. Totally different. I'll give you the example. <clears throat> I wouldn't if I was a club manager. I wouldn't have made Alan Shearer my my captain, although he's a good leader anyway, and I think he had the right contribute. Uh, um, the talents to be a captain and that's why I made him captain at England level but you do it for different reasons because he had the, he had the leadership within himself as a player but it's the respect that referees and the opponents have and world football has for that type of player at a club level you'd have a Stevie Perriman or you maybe have um, a Paul Lintz or a Tony Adams or a, you know day to day Club club level is completely different. Like it is managing the England team or managing a club or playing for your club or playing for... It's totally two different scenarios. Um, and and for me, captaincy was always judged, and, and Steve would have this, as games where he would be playing not so well. He'd be the first to admit he's having a bit of a bad game. But he wouldn't be any different. And his captaincy levels, he would not be any different. He'd be digging out people. You know, he'd be saying, this is what the teams needed. It was always the team first. And he would come out in meetings and say that. And, and, and you could easily say, well, Steve, you didn't have the best game yourself. But you realise that that's, that's, the big, that's where it shows real captaincy. When you're not playing so well, but you're still doing the things that if you were playing well, that you'd say. So you'd, you'd dig people out, you give them encouragement, you do this, you do that, you might. And that's what Steve was like. And that's where I thought, wow. That's what real captaincy is about, you know. And it's not about shouting and screaming at people. And if that needs to be done, he'd have done it. But it's not about that. That's for show. Some of the best captains is just that little one word that you just get in your ear and you go, oh, OK, yeah. And that's great captaincy. And Steve had that. Uh, brilliant. Glenn, thanks for coming in and telling us your uh, top five Spurs players. We're going to ask I apologise to, to all the ones that I... No, yeah. we'll ask you to come back and we'll give you a top 20 next time. 20. Is that okay? I'll come back You'll with top still 20. still struggle. I'll still struggle, yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah, I mean, there's so many players that, oh my word. It, when, it, when it was asked, I said, I can't do five. But it is what it is, you know. Not everyone's going to agree with that. Of course not. But there's reasons, hopefully, behind playing with them and try and give you a little bit of into why I've, I've gone with those five, actually. Yeah. There's reasons behind it, but... Wonderful. There's some wonderful players that I haven't picked, yeah. without a doubt, you know. Uh, thanks, Glenn. I've just got Chris Waddle on the phone. He wants to have a word with you. Uh, thanks for joining us, He's Glenn. the best singer I've ever sung with. <laughs> you said he was the second best. Well, you were the best. Well, yeah. 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 Second best, then. <laughs> Glenn, thanks so much for joining us. A tough decision. Next time on Football's Greatest... He also had another tape, so Alex, which he used to play in the boss, Glenn Daly singing, uh, whatever it was. But uh, we got rid of that as a team. He still doesn't know to this day who chucked it out the window. This <laughs> Glenn Daly live at some social club, somebody chucked it out the window. He was a small guy. and uh, so he's sitting quite close to me? Yeah, I recognise him over <laughs> there. Yeah, uh, now, if you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss an episode of Football's Greatest. And if you're listening to us on your favourite podcast platform, please press follow so you get us in your feed every week. Thanks for joining us. Football's Greatest is a folding pocket production with BBC Studios.